next speaker. So she is Vanessa Magar, and she is a scientist at the Physical Oceanography Department at the Ensenada Center for Scientific Research and Higher Education, otherwise known as ICESE in Mexico. She did her bachelor's degree in physics at UNAM and her PhD in fluid mechanics at the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics of the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. And she specializes in coastal oceanography and applied meteorology with a focus on wind and tidal energy. And she is currently the president of, of the Mexican Geophysical uh, Union. So th this is just a very, very short summary of, of, her, of her CV, which is quite impressive, but uh, just, uh, just to let her, let, give her time to, to, for her talk. Um, Vanessa, uh, would you like to share your, your screen? Right, okay. Okay, yep. Is yep. the same screen now? Yes, everything is fine. So, okay, the, the floor is yours. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, um, Oscar. And uh, well, thank you again for the invitation. Uh, I see you have a, a lot of uh, people attending this course, which is really good. And uh, I hope you enjoy this presentation. Um, it's on offshore wind energy and uh, mostly discussing energy, um, the industry status and the project life, life cycle. Um, my name is Vanessa Magar, as Oscar, as Oscar said, I am a co-leader of the GEM lab in the Department of Physical Oceanography at CCC, and my co-leader is Marcus Gross, who will also be presenting on Wednesday, but uh, he will discuss more um, about issues with technical um, aspects of, of, of wind and other renewable energies, and today it's a very general overview of um, what the status is and where it's going and how engineers and scientists can contribute uh, to this project. So our group works in different aspects of renewable energy. Uh, we are part of the PRONACES, uh, which are some new initiatives of the Mexican government uh, on research and social impact of renewable energy. We have contributions in the CIGOM, the Consortium of the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, free, since this year, we are in charge of the um, um, Oceanographic Boys project of CIGOM. We have uh, a lot of work uh, on uh, renewable energy in the Gulf of California. This is what we started developing when we arrived here in CSA in 2014. Uh, we have developed some methods and some research and, and we have done some uh, field work experiments as uh, part of the semi-oceano and some supercomputing uh, code developments in the National Laboratory, Laboratory of Puebla. And we finally, I would also want to mention we are part of MEVA, which is uh, a project uh, linking mesoscale and microscale modeling for wind energy. MEVA is focused uh, on onshore projects, but uh, as I mentioned, this talk will be on offshore wind. Despite this, there are many, many um, analogies for all sorts of renewable energies on what we will discuss today. So I have a few resources that uh, I would like to mention. Different countries have uh, been um, making extreme efforts to, uh, to develop offshore wind, uh, starting from Denmark, who were the first to install an offshore wind farm in, the, in 1991. But uh, there have been a lot of initiatives in the UK, in Germany, in France, and the US is slowly catching up. A lot of uh, things I will be discussing today are actually part of our training workshop um, that is uh, given by DNV. Uh, DNV is a very large company and, uh, and advisory group that do a lot of um, work and, and provide a lot of services for offshore projects. So uh, uh, what is the industry status of offshore wind? And um, 
In this part, I would like to discuss why is offshore wind important? What is the historic uh, um, background? What is the status? Sorry, what is the status and what are the major, major um, trends as well and trends in costs? And I would like to highlight what um, sort of the ambitions are for the US um, in term, um, in re with uh, regarding offshore wind here. Yeah? And the goal is to deploy 30 gigawatts by 2030. So that's uh, nine years from now, yeah. The goal as well as part of this is not just to deploy this offshore wind farms. Obviously there are many, many implications of um, building, um, planning, building, construct, um, installing, operating, maintaining, and so on and so forth. So they are, um, they expect to be, supporting 77,000 jobs and invest more than $12 billion per year. And one of the main difficulties that the industry is facing all over the world and not just in the US is the development of uh, adequate vessels and adequate ports to sustain this new industry. I will not discuss this in detail because we don't have enough time here. But uh, it's just something that you have to bear in mind. Yeah, the technology, it's not just developing that technology, which is obviously very important. As we saw from the previous talk, there are many, many um, avenues of research and development that can be explored both onshore and offshore for wind energy. Yeah, but there are other uh, parallel industries uh, that also need developing, and that's an offshore, offshore vessels that are adequate for the industry is one of them as well as uh, support upgrades. So this um, slide that I'm showing you um, highlights one, one of the main um, difficulties or one of the main aims that we, we would like to, to achieve when we do energy developments, yeah? And I'm not talking about the sustainability only of the wind, um, energy plants yeah we also are need to take into account the reliability of the plants and that has a strong impact as well on the affordability of the plants yeah the many 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 issues and many many companies that have gone into administration because they have overlooked one of these aspects um, so uh, the en energy needs to be affordable and available, and it needs to be secure and re reliable as well as the, as being green and, and clean, yeah? So there is no, not one of these that is more important than the other, and there is no single pathway to achieve a good energy mix. And oil and gas, the oil and gas contribution, mm -hmm, will be declining because oil and gas are, are not renewable energies. Yeah, the reserves are, are declining and that has been shown by many researchers and um, government advisors. And so we need to make sure that we use this, um, re this resource in the best possible way. Yeah, and one of them is actually to, to use the reserves for plastics, clothes and other, and other um, users that are important for us and not for energy production, which is not only is not only going to be more and more expensive, but it all it's also not not uh, not clean, and uh, it is um, emitting a lot of green gas, a uh, lot of um, harmful gases into the atmosphere. Yeah. There's also other justifications from offshore wind. Yeah, it's one of the most uh, eff efficient energy uh, ways of producing energies. Yeah, it has the highest capacity factor of any of the technologies developed so far for converting um, um, renewable energy into electricity. And uh, some of the newest turbines have actually capacity factors of the order of 60%. Yeah, this is an enormous improvement from uh, other, other um, technologies, like in, including onshore wind, which has a capacity factor between 20 and 30%. Yeah.
I now move on to a historic comparison and um, how the industry has developed over the years. As I mentioned before, the Dan Danes have been pioneers in, in the in wind industry, not only offshore wind, but since the 70s. In Denmark, there were a lot of developments of uh, wind farms um, led by small cooperatives. And uh, I would like to mention that that's something that we are now trying to do in Mexico within the Peronasis initiatives, yeah, to uh, try to um, develop wind energy projects uh, and any, any renewable energy project that is led by uh, cooperatives and by the local communities. Yeah, this has been shown to be a very, very uh, cost-effective and very uh, good for um, making sure that the investment goes back to the local community. And I won't go into a lot of detail uh, on, about this. I will discuss it um, if I have time a little bit more at the end of the talk in the context of offshore wind, yeah? So going back to a historic comparison, yeah? As you can see from this um, table, how uh, you can see how the, the wind farms have increased in, in size, not only in the number of turbines, but the turbines have increased their um, installed capacity from 450 kilowatts uh, to um, nowadays almost uh, 14 megawatts. Horsey, Point C1 is using a seven megawatt turbine, which is now one of the leading um, commercial turbines. But as I mentioned, um, there are other initiatives that have been um, looking into already 14 megawatt turbines. So as you can see from this table in 30 years, which uh, is the time between Vindabu and Horn C1, the hop height has tripled and the blade length has quadrupled. And this has important impacts on not only the amount of energy that you can capture from the, from the wind, but also makes the, um, the capture of this energy more stable. So you are not so dependent on the intermittency of the wind resource, which is something very important. Um, in, in the American continent, we have just started installing the first offshore wind farms, even though there has been um, for 10 years a lot of uh, efforts to try to do the first installations in the US, but there were a lot of, um, of uh, policy and um, popular uh, opposition. And so this had to be solved. And that's something that is very important in wind energy and the any renewable energy, yeah, there, are, there needs to be a lot of contact with the local communities to, to uh, make sure that they support the projects. So once this, this was resolved, a lot of um, offshore wind plants have been planned and are now currently being installed in the East Coast uh, in, of the US. Uh, the New York, um, New York um, governor was a very strong supporter of uh, wind offshore wind and he implemented a lot of policies that allowed um, wind energy to develop and that's why we are seeing now uh, this there's large projects under construction in the northeast coast of the u.s however other areas of the u.s are slowly catching up in the 20 in 2020 they started building an offshore wind farm in virginia Currently, it's a pilot project. They only have 12 megawatts installed, but their plan, sorry, they only have two six megawatt turbines installed, which is 12 megawatts in total, but they are planning to install many more turbines in this pilot site. And California, on the western side of the US, is now betting on offshore wind, and in particular, offshore floating wind, because in California, we have a very thin um, very thin um, continental shelf, and therefore offshore floating wind is um, possibly a, a very good option once the offshore wind, um, the floating turbines have caught up with the technological developments that are needed for commercial implementation. Um, 
I would like to discuss now the projections in terms of installed capacity and um, discuss as well what the major markets are. And I will start with the global, the global um, capacity. As you can see from this slide, Europe is the major player since uh, for the last 20 years. Uh, so, sorry, for the last 10 years, they have um, been increasing their installed capacity year after year. But China is slowly catching up. Yeah, and uh, in 2020, they almost doubled the capacity they installed in 2019, they had installed in 2019. So you can see there is a very, very strong interest from the Chinese government to increase the installed capacity in offshore wind. And the rest of the world, unfortunately, has been almost an observer now uh, with very little, very little initiatives going on. But um, don't, don't worry about it. I'm sure that India will very soon become a very important player as well. And the other, other, um, other markets will also start in, uh, increasing their installed capacity. And now up, we, we can see that now we have um, almost more than 700 gigawatts installed uh, taking it into account onshore and offshore wind together. And so very, we will very, very soon in less than a decade, get to 1000 gigawatts of installed capacity all over the world and wind, not only offshore, but onshore wind. And as you recall, the US is aiming to install 30 gigawatts of um, offshore wind capacity by 2030. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of activity all around the world, not only uh, not only in Europe, but you can see the major players here are um, mostly European countries with China being the exception. Uh, and Vietnam is also quite high up in this table. This is from uh, 4C offshore, which is a, a very important uh, source of information for offshore wind. And this is the cumulative capacity that is on the way. And these are projections for 2030. We only mentioned the case of the United States, but you can see the United States are not one of are not just are not the only player, no, that has a lot of interests in offshore wind, China, the United Kingdom, Germany, ne the Netherlands, and Taiwan are above the United States uh, are are also pushing on offshore wind, as well as other players. So now we move on to the trends in costs. Yeah, the trends in costs are very important because um, one of the major issues with offshore energy renewable, uh, offshore renewables is that they are usually about 10 times uh, more expensive than uh, onshore renewables and therefore uh, the offshore industry has to justify very well this um, increase in um, this this increase in cost. Yeah, one of these uh, justifications is the increased uh, of the increase of capacity factor as to install offshore, and that also has uh, impact on the um, on the, on the industry. However, we have strong uh, competition. Yeah, we need to we need to overcome many many barriers, and one of these barriers, as I mentioned earlier, is the link between offshore wind farm um, installation and operation and maintenance, and the development of uh, appropriate ports and the vessel industry. And therefore, we need to uh, to reach a point where we have a a stabilization of the market between the different um, the different aspects of uh, that uh, of uh, another the center supply chain issues that affect um, the capital expenditure and um, as you can see as well from this from this uh, uh, graph the wind, the size of the wind farms and installed capacity has been increasing with time. And this uh, as well can be explained by the 
what is called the economy of scale uh, aspect of um, any industry. Yeah, the economy of scale means that um, sometimes it's as expensive to install um, 400 kilowatt wind turbine as it is to install um, two megawatt wind turbine. And therefore, this is something that the industry is um, is taking into account now. And therefore, we have this this larger developments. It's also easier to control um, the to follow protocol standards appropriately and uh, operation and maintenance standards adequately if you have um, if you have larger plants. And that's something the smaller developers need to to consider. Yeah. The capital expenditure uh, breakdown uh, is as follows. As you can see, most of most of the capital expenditure has to go into the the turbines. Um, the another part of the of the capital ex expenditure goes into the electrical development, and that and that is followed by the foundation supply. So these are the three main aspects of the capital expenditure. And these are indicative project cost break, uh, breakdown for the um, levelized cost of electricity or of energy. This is a very important indicator because it allows us to compare different types of um, technologies and different types of um, of industries with the same with the same indicator. And again, as you can see, the lab, from the levelized cost of energy and, and electricity, the turbine itself has the largest contribution, followed by the operation and maintenance, which are, as well has a very important uh, contribution to the cost of um, for the wind farms. Yeah, but as as I mentioned, that's one of the reasons why. Uh, the wind energy industry is developing larger plants, larger farms, and larger turbines to try to, to um, make sure that this these costs are level are balanced balanced in an adequate way by the return by the return in energy production. So this is um, it from uh, the first part on the industry status. And from what we have discussed, uh, you can uh, de deduce that there are a large range of elements that depend on the size and on the location of the offshore wind farm. We also discussed that there's a trend towards larger turbines, but as well towards larger plants and a trend towards offshore wind farms staying further offshore. This has also been driven by some um, discussions with the with the communities and with the with the local governments and by uh, the the sort of the concerns that local communities have regarding um, damage to the landscape um, caused by wind plants and that that's something i haven't discussed uh, in detail here but uh, moving further offshore was one of um was driven at uh, initially by but those issues yeah as we mentioned the offshore wind uh, industry is a semi mature industry there are many issues not not necessarily associated with uh with the wind turbines because we have already a design that is commercially viable although obviously there are many initiatives developing other types of devices and that's obviously very important as we saw from eduardo's talk here but there are many other issues that are associated with uh, the development of the offshore wind industry that need to be addressed. And there are many innovations that can be undertaken in this, in this um, sector. We will now move on to the second part of this talk, uh, which focuses on project life cycle. And although I call that an overview, because I will I will show you um, what all the what phases are necessary to develop an offshore wind plant uh, successfully, I will um, I have to I have to say that I will talk a lot more on the first stages 
because that's what we have been mostly focusing on in Mexico since we don't have yet an offshore wind farm. Um, that there is not much else we can do ex uh, unless we work uh, with colleagues in other countries, you know, which we do. But I would, um, but I would like to focus on the things we do, which are relevant for Mexico. Yeah. So I will discuss general phases and activities per phase in this in this life cycle. I will also talk about the timeline because there seems to be. Um, some sort of a misunderstanding on how long a, a project um, takes and uh, sometimes um, it may seem like uh, the more people are involved the faster the industry will will move forward which is partially true but there are certain restrictions in the timeline that mean that uh, do you 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 need to take into account these restrictions so i will discuss early acti uh, activities in the early phases and through the operation and management uh, and maintenance of the wind farm. And I will close with some remarks on the offshore wind industry. So these are the general offshore wind phases. They can be split um, roughly into five. The feasibility analysis is the first, um, is the first phase, which involves several sub, sub uh, activities like finding the site, which sometimes is not obvious, doing all the leasing, doing the, all the studies, the geotechnical studies and the environmental and geophysical studies, analyzing the grid connection and, and uh, the select uh, the concept. So the concept means what is going to be, what sort of turbine you will be installing, what will be your offshore wind plant uh, layout and um, analyze, how, what will be the, the energy yield of, of this plant. The second phase is the development phase where you do the preliminary surveys of the site. You make uh, several site measurements, which you do as well in the feasibility analysis, but in the development phase, these are uh, uh, not optional anymore. Yeah, this, you have to do site measurements and you need to do uh, several project optimization activities to make sure that uh, your layout and your site selection was um, was adequate. And sometimes it's um, sometimes it turns out that you have to make adjustments and you have to take those adjustments into account and not just take those adjustments into account on paper, but also take those adjustments into account in your financial um, planning. And sometimes, uh, we don't take necessarily, we don't put enough emphasis on the financial aspect of, of projects, which is unfortunate because um, this, these projects require a lot of funding and uh, this, this funding needs to be used in the most optimal way, otherwise um, you run into problems, yeah. So the third aspect is the engineering part of, um, of the offshore wind farm development. I will not uh, get into a lot of detail, but the project finance comes into play here very strongly. The procurement here, yeah, so the up um, there getting the all the all the permits and all the all the uh, all the techni technology in place to be deployed, so that you can move on to the construction part of the project, where you have to uh, do all the uh, electrical system development, install the foundations and here the ports and vessels um, part comes into play very strongly although they play an important role in the earlier phases as well because of the, obviously you need to plan for this stage from the beginning and not leave that um, when you get to the construction phase not leave the thinking about the construction phase until that moment and finally the operations and maintenance phase where we work a lot on inspections as well as uh, geoscientists, as engineers, we still have a, a very important role to play, even it, it may not be as obvious, but we still have to do a lot of activities in operation and maintenance that involve um, our specialized uh, areas. This, this, um, this, um, Project life cycle overview does not include the decommissioning phase, 
that's also another very important aspect of um, of um, project life life cycle planning that the commissioning now by law in some countries needs to be taken into account in your financial um, planning of the projects because it's not any more optional to um, to do the decommissioning adequately and as they say in Europe you need to leave the place as you found it yeah so this means that the financial your financial planning needs to separate a significant amount of uh, resources for this decommissioning yeah so as i mentioned earlier i mean there, there is a timeline that you have to follow and uh, it doesn't matter if you have one person working in the feasibility or a uh, study or 10,000 people working in the feasibility study yeah this timeline cannot be squeezed into a three years or two years uh, and you obviously you don't want to squeeze this into two or three years you want to have a project that will last for your career if you like yeah or be involved in a project that will last for the whole, all of your career. And that is also something that um, is very interesting from, from my perspective, no, to be working in a sector that is so, so exciting in that sense that uh, you, can, you can find many research and development um, avenues to, uh, for, for the rest of your life, of your working life, yeah? So and, uh, here you can see you know, the feasibility stage uh, in general is um, takes three years. The development and design stage will take about two years. The engineering stage will take about two years, yeah. And the construction will also take about two years. So in the end, you have eight years from uh, feasibility to construction to take into account. And during your operation, yeah, here we have a very ambitious plan to have a plant lasting for 35 years. Bindabu uh, reached its um, end of life after 25 years, but that was the first plant developed. Um, that's something you have to take into account. So now wind turbines are built um, in better ways with better materials that last longer and so on. It's not unrealistic to think that a plant could last for more than 35 years in operation, yeah? Or between 25 and 35 years in operation. And at the end, you have to, as I mentioned earlier, the decommissioning, which also needs to, to be included in your project life cycle plan. Most of what I will discuss now is focused on the first stages, which are, are on-site characterization, and uh, but also as you can see from this uh, project timeline this is not the only issue that uh, is involved in the feasibility yeah you also need to have people working on the leasing people looking into the permitting people starting to look at the design of the farm and most uh, importantly the ports and vessels issue to do the siting adequately and the project um sorry and the power the PTO, yeah, the transmission, and have the power takeoff, yeah, of your devices. Yeah, that also is important to take into account, yeah, because the um, the local local wind and uh, conditions are going to be very important here, yeah, so that you choose the most adequate device, the most adequate turbine to to um extract no more, more efficiently the uh, the energy from the environment as well very important yeah and that shouldn't be neglected at all is the safety considerations yeah the offshore industry is a very dangerous industry yeah like uh, i was discussing with marcus the other day he was mentioning that uh, the being a port uh, vessel operator is one of the most dangerous jobs um today yeah you have a one in 20 chances of dying on the job yeah so I, yeah this is something as well that cannot be neglected uh, when you're doing field work you have to follow protocols and you have to comply to the standards and for that you need a lot of training 
and a lot of practice and as well that's something that you should be overlooking yeah your team has to be well trained to do all this work <coughs> and uh because of the time constraints we have here in this workshop yeah i will start moving faster and and uh in the talk yeah and I will discuss as, as so, some examples on the first part of the site characterization, which involves the phys geophysical surveys, the geotechnical investigations. And I will um, first um, show you why they are important and what do these studies entail. Yeah. So first part is the site seabed site investigations, and this uh, this is very important because it uh, will have an impact on the stability of your turbines, especially if you're, this, you're talking about um, not floating wind, although floating wind also need, for floating wind, you also need to do this site investigations, this um, geotechnical and geological investigations. But for um, pylon installations or gravity-based installations, you still need to, to do this site, in, this seabed investigations, yeah? The rule of thumb is more or less like uh, you will be burying um, two thirds of the submerged part of the pylon into into the sand or the seabed, and one third will be in the water. Yeah, or sometimes they they use the one to one. Yeah, one part of your monopile will be buried, one part of your monopile will be submerged. Yeah, so this also makes a uh, the water depth at which you can install um, found foundation um, turbines very small. Yeah, once you go over sixty meters, you can you can also you can already say that you are in in deep water as far as the wind industry is concerned. Yeah, while uh, for the uh, offshore oil industry, deep water is five hundred meters. Yeah. So this, this as well is uh, something to be considered. And then the foundation design, the issues to take into account are the bathymetry. So this is the main design driver and therefore you need to have a very good bathymetry. You need to take into account geo geotechnical parameters because this affects the foundation design and the selection. And what are the, what are the risks of scour and as well for, um, offshore wind farms, you need to have designed a scour protection design so the war, otherwise your turbines will fall as soon as, as after a, a very short time. And that's uh, very important, especially in shallow waters or when you're building in, in sandbanks, because sandbanks are, are more affected by waves and therefore you need to, to have better scour protection designs. And you also need to avoid scour induced resonance of the monopole this this has to do with the stability of the of the turbine. The second part of the investigation is concerns the installation planning planning mm -hmm. and uh, this, this planning involves the protection of the leg depth the, and how you will uh, and the risks involved in all the drilling activities as well as the obstructions and hazards that could be found in the site and uh, this is important for the North Sea in particular where there are many mines and many bombs from the Second World War that uh, are still being found on the seabed and there are many activities to actually explode this ordnance um, in a safe way once they've, they've been found so you need to, be, to have techniques for finding this this bombs so that's very important, something we may not need here in Mexico, but um, in the North Sea, it's uh, one, one, a very big hazard, yeah? So the seabed uh, investigations are of importance because uh, there are many environmental assessments that need to be take, uh, to take place. And you need a seabed type and baseline data from the, of the geological properties of your seabed. To, and this need to be in high in high detail, otherwise you will need to move your farm somewhere else. You need to take into account the sediment transport risks, and especially in shallow waters, this can this can be important, and as well on um, 
mud day type of seabed or sandy seabeds as well. That sediment transport obviously is larger than in rocky, rocky seabeds. The biological aspects and the socioeconomic and cultural aspects are also to be taken into account. And in particular, there's a lot of emphasis on archaeological sites uh, and identification of archaeological importance of sites um, in uh, all over the world. And some sites that you may not think have any archaeological importance, then you find out that they actually are very important. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to find that out once you have already done all the planning of your installation. So what do the seabed investigation entail? Well, the first part is to create a geological model. And this geological model actually involves different, uh, different uh, activities. You need to involve to collect ground information on ground conditions, interpret the new information, update your, your geological model, and identify the remaining unknowns. If your no, remaining unknowns are important, then you need to plan a further investigation and go over the cycle again until you find that the remaining un unknowns are acceptable and you can move forward to the next stage of of the planet. So and these geophysical surveys involve um, towed, send, receive, and scanning devices that can analyze seabed surface and the subsurface as well. And you also need to perform some geotechnical studies. The geophysical surveys, as we mentioned, need to consider the bathymetry. There are many new Eco sounding uh, methods that can give you very detailed information on the bathymetry and the characteristics of the seabed. And now the uh, bathymetries can be um, actually performed at 100 meter resolution, even, even at uh, 10 meter of the order of 10 meter resolutions with um, uh, very, very accurate um, devices. Yeah, the eco sounding instruments that are being towed by boats. Um, and this is an example of by the British Antarctic Survey. And this uh, seabed uh, images can then be used um, as a bound as bottom seabed conditions for, for numerical model and be linked to the cost of processes at the site. The, the, oh, not only the seabed needs to be mapped, do we also need maps of the subsurface as I mentioned, this has a very important. Uh, this is very important for offshore wind because a lot of the pylon is going to be buried on on the seabed, yeah. And therefore, this these surveys are also they also have to be carried out. And these surveys need to be uh, complemented by borehole measurements. Borehole measurements are actually a very, very expensive because you need to drill under the sea, the seabed and take samples of the subsurface and uh, analyze the type of sediments you have on the subsurface for several meters. And then uh, this actually makes uh, these studies um, quite expensive, yeah? But there are many developments as well in um, of new new instrumentation for drill, drilling on the seabed. This this is uh, the water the depths that uh, you 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 have to you have to overcome are about thirty to forty meters for monopiles and forty to fifty meters for jackets, and therefore you need to you need to to go to quite um, high depths once once you are taking into account this this aspect of the project but as i said there are many many new developments on drilling techniques that are being applied to offshore wind um, we will now discuss what um what sort of studies are considered in the second part of the site characterization and um this combined with the first part on the geophysical and geotechnical studies can, can inform the project design and therefore it's linked to project optimization analysis, yeah? 
The second part is not on the C, but on the sub C. Anessa, C. If you can finish in the in the next few minutes, that would be that would be great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sorry, yeah. sorry. I thought I have ten more minutes, but that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, that that's okay. So that's that should be around. Yeah. That's okay. Fine. So okay, the thanks. second. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the site characterization, the second part are the wind and met ocean studies. Yeah. And so this I entail some this you need to have critical data for the design and the operations. And not only on the on the seafloor, which is the aspect um we focused on on the first part, but you you all need to have a good met ocean and wind uh, wind uh, measurements, not only modeling aspects yeah so good desperate description of current conditions waves and water levels as well as wave conditions the sea states and these are important for the energy production but also for the design the construction and the operation and this this graph shows you a, a polygon yeah for um an offshore wind farm plant you can see these little triangles are the um the wind turbine position so the wind resource, the energy and the uncertainty analysis. This is an overview of this aspect of the play of the uh, wind uh, energy resource. So you start with the wind analysis, then you do a wind flow model that includes the terrain data. So the bathymetry that you uh, procured before and uh, you analyze your wind uh, resource in terms of energy uh, production. And they here your most important indica indicator is the annual energy production. But as well, you need to go to the micro scale and analyze the wakes that uh, you, you will be generating with the turbines to try to optimize the, the, um, the, uh, the, the power that you will uh, be generating with, with your turbine and analyze the losses as well as do an uncertainty analysis. This will lead to your energy assessment. Yeah. So this you can be basing base basing your analysis with us with um measurements. Yeah. For measurements, we can use um this meteor meteorological tower. So you can use uh oceanographic voice. Yeah. This resource uh, this allows you to, to measure mean wind speeds, extreme wind speeds, turbulence, shear, and take where air density measurements to analyze the normal wind conditions as well as the extreme wind conditions. So, so this uh, both of this these aspects are important. Yeah, your normal conditions and your extreme conditions. And therefore, you need to have uh, measurements or modeling efforts that are that are that uh, extend for more than one year. And ideally, in the wind industry, one year is the minimum, yeah? And which means you have many difficulties to overcome when it comes to doing um, in situ measurements, yeah? Because you need to have measurements for a year. But also the numerical modeling aspect uh, needs to be considered and not just uh, kilometer scale uh, modeling, which is the mesoscale um, um, spatial resolution, but you, go to, you need to go to the micro scale resolution, which is of the order of 10 meters when you're looking at the wind farm side tank. Yeah? And that also means there's another level of uh, complexity in the modeling where you have to to um, change your parameterizations of the model. Uh, so you can resolve some of the turbulence and you can resolve some of the physical phenomena at the micro scale. So this is uh, the, um, sort of the methodology to compute uh, the energy production of a wind farm. Yeah, the full definition is the, uh, the, the energy production, uh, effective energy production is a theoretical energy production times a number of factors that um, take into account the losses. Yeah. So you need to loop over all the directions uh, the wind is blowing, to loop over all the wind speeds for each of these directions, to loop over all the turbines, to calculate the wake effects. Yeah. And um, starting from the incremental energy uh, for each of the wind, each wind speed and each direction. Yeah. 
there you need to include the density adjustment of the power curve and you need to sum all these energy increments and then apply your uncertainties and your losses in the computation. The main losses are due to the wakes, but you also have losses from the electrical system, from environmental conditions, from problems with access, and also from degradation of the blades or from the utility downtime. And currently, we can, um, the operators uh, have um, realized that um, the best uh, position of the turbines is not completely perpendicular to the wind direction, but slightly at an angle, because then the wakes are not aligned from wind turbine to wind turbine, and that actually increases the energy yield. So these are things that you find out uh, with time and that uh, you make small adjustments to overcome these losses, yeah? As I said, the annual energy production is the central estimate, mm -hmm. and you need to take into account uncertainties due to many, many parameters. I, we mentioned the wakes, but that's only one aspect. You also need uncertainties from time period, and that we have a paper actually that we published um, recently uh, with Dr. Gross, um, looking at this uncertainty from the time period that you are considering, and also other aspects. Yeah. And the other issue with the site characterization are the met ocean studies. Yeah, you need to uh, analyze the tides, the surge components due to storms and future sea level rise due to climate change, as well as um, developing models for the prediction of the tidal range and the extreme conditions so that you can find um, the extreme events accurately and um, do your design based on these extreme events, yeah? So these are several aspects of the um, Met Ocean studies. I won't go into detail with this because I have only a few minutes left. But as I said, the, the site characterization is one of the main issues. And uh, this is something that uh, we as engineers and scientists, um, we have been involved uh, mostly, yeah? So this, this are some of the outputs and the applications no, of the Met Ocean studies. And the exceeded statistics, as you can see here, is one of the aspects um, that is um, that you have to consider because this this also has uh, implications on the design and on the fatigue load calculations. And for this, you need to take into account the extreme conditions to look at the extreme loads and the design and adjust your design. And uh, with the metocean studies comes the current analysis. The current analysis is actually very important for a from a practical point of view, because it, all is, it determines where you're going to, well, it helps determine where you're going to put your landing, um, your boat landing uh, on the wind far, on the wind uh, turbine, yeah? And uh, so, so, um, so from a practical point of view, this is very important. Okay, so as I said earlier, yeah, well, we, we don't have time to go into all, all of this, uh, all, of, all of the activities involved, yeah, but from the beginning, you need to, to make sure, yeah, you, in, you include in your, in your planning the port and vessel accessibility and the power takeoff and the transmission that uh, you have access to as well and all the protocols and standards that you have to comply to, to have a successful implementation of your project. Mm -hmm. Another aspect that should not be overlooked in your planning is your stakeholder engagement and your consent strategy. Yeah, many, many projects have been unsuccessful because they haven't taken this into account adequately. Mm -hmm. And therefore, yeah, your siting not only needs to consider uh, the, the met ocean conditions or the wind conditions, it, the supply chain, the commercial viability and the grid connections are extremely important. And your marine spatial planning and how you are sharing the use of space is also extremely important, yeah? So that you avoid any conflicts and you avoid any environmental damage or socioeconomical damage. 
The other half of the project life, life cycle, yeah, I, I won't have time at all to discuss this, but we also have a lot of um, contributions to make and all these other aspects of the project life cycle. And finally, yeah, I would like to close with uh, the issues involving the benefits to local communities. Yeah, there are many, there have been many problems in Mexico because of opposition from uh, local communities to obviously not offshore because we still don't have any offshore wind farms, but to onshore wind farms because they have, there has been um, no policies put in place so that the um, companies of the, that are developing this, uh, this project actually have an impact on the local community, yeah? So I will talk about the Orsted offshore wind activities. Orsted has a strong, a stronger community focus. They've invested over 10 billion pounds constructing offshore wind farms in the UK, but they don't only uh, construct offshore wind farms, they also transform the local communities through investment in local facilities, through investment and in training for um, developing a portfolio of uh, several high skilled jobs. And they develop a competitive export oriented local supply chain. And for Greens Grimsby, for example, Grimsby is a small town in the east coast of the UK. They've completely transformed the town and the life of the young people in the town because they've been training a lot of a lot of the local community. They now have an award-winning facility that supports over three, 370 workers. And these are long-term investments. Uh, these jobs, these high-skilled jobs will be available and will be will 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 be needed for the next 35 years yeah and with this i would like to close uh, this presentation and i would like to thank you all for for your attending and uh, i uh, don't know if i have any time for questions i'm uh, over one minute over my time so thank you very much thank you very much thank you very much for for this uh very illuminating talk so I think we have a few minutes for, for questions. So but first, uh, join me on, on using the reactions functions to, to thank Vanessa for her talk. And if you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand uh, or put your question in the chat so that we can, we can read it aloud. So far as I don't see any, so I, I, I can ask mine. So, so, so far, what do you think? I, I, it's probably a very obvious one, but uh, what, what do you think is, are the main challenges for the development of offshore wind energy in, in Mexico? Is it, would it be the, the social aspects again, as, as is happening on, with onshore or, I don't know. No, I don't. I don't think for offshore the social aspect is the is the biggest challenge. It's something that obviously needs to be taken into account from the beginning, and you need to make sure that your offshore wind farm has a social benefit, and that it is benefiting the coastal communities uh, that are closest to your development. But I think the main issue in Mexico is the supply chain. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um... Osvaldo, would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Vanessa, for your presentation. Um, as I am understanding, um, you, you are um, saying that uh, we have this feasibility, this technical feasibility in Mexico to develop these offshore wind farms, but uh, I think that a, a very interesting point of view is that you are proposing or putting in the table these um, community benefits, right? Um, could you please comment a little bit more about this? How, how can we use these benefits, inherent benefits from uh, renewable energy sources of wind power in local benefits, right? Because from uh, our experience in Mexico, this, well, yes, we have benefits uh, by, by using renewable energies, but 
how to translate these benefits in local benefits. And uh, thank you again for your presentation, Vanessa. Right. Okay. Thank you for the question, Osvaldo. Um, there are many ways of uh, of um, sort of having an impact on the local communities. Uh, they may be less obvious, yeah, from um, what, from uh, what you can uh, have uh, for your own short projects, yeah. But they, but you still can have the same sort of benefits. The, um, and um, historically in Mexico, most of the benefit uh, has been translated into some sort of um, rental income, yeah, for the local community. But that has been shown that is actually not enough, and it's it's actually not been not really beneficial to the communities. Yeah, it leads to a lot of in 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 community fights actually. No, for because some of the people are benefited because the turbine is on their land and the another member of the community is not benefiting because the turbine is not in their land and so it creates all sorts of problems and as well this uh, income from land rental is is minute compared to the um, in to the um income generated by this uh, renewable energy project so that's not enough that's definitely not enough no and you need to have other types of uh, of um of benefits, it's not enough either to, to be um, well. A lot for our state has been giving a lot of uh, a lot of uh, donations, for example, to uh, to several charities in the UK. Charities with who focus on vulnerable on the development of vulnerable community projects and who need funding, no. And a lot of funding comes from the offshore wind farm developers who give that money for other things that have nothing to do with the offshore wind farm itself, no? But that are also, they are also important for the community, no? And from the point of view of the wind farm itself, yeah, uh, in the case of the UK, a lot of fisheries have declined and that's something that we also are experiencing in Mexico. So if you are developing a new industry, you are also developing a new range of uh, high skilled jobs that come with it, yeah? And you can set up development uh, training programs, uh, apprenticeship programs with the local communities so that they become technicians um, who work on the offshore wind industry. And uh, if some of these skills are transferable, they don't need to stay in offshore wind, they could move on to onshore wind, or to all other renewable energy um, uh, companies, because a lot of these skills are, are needed in other renewable energy sec, um, industry. And uh, also, as I mentioned, these are long-term skilled jobs that um, are, will be needed not only in, during the construction, but throughout the operation of the, of the plant. Okay, I don't know if you. that answers your thank question. Yes, thank you very much, Vanessa. Thank you, Vanessa. There are other questions, but first I need to ask uh, Grecia if we can keep going because I don't know. I, I thought the the session was about to finish, so I, I don't know if is it okay if we continue for to the next two question, Grecia? Or, or Osvaldo, is it is it all right? Yes, I think it will be okay. Uh, okay, okay, excellent. Take so a couple uh, of then, minutes. Yes, yes. Okay, so then Eduardo, would you like to ask your question as well? Yes. Uh, hi, Vanessa. Good morning. Um, uh, thanks for your talk. And I, um, I would like to 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 try to understand. If we as a, a, a scientific and engineering community would like to contribute to the development of offshore wind energy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it seems to me that um, if we don't identify specific uh, jobs to be done or, or projects to be developed by our community, then we will repeat the, the experience that we are um, suffering right now with the onshore uh, installation of, uh, of wind farms. Uh, we Mexicans are, are just kind of uh, we, we witness the installation of the farms because we don't contribute at all in the in the projects, and then 
not even the, the well-paid jobs are given to, to Mexicans. So um, instead of turning to the, to the possibility of uh, um, bringing some benefits to the community, what in, in, the, in, in the sense that you have just described, would it be possible to develop technology or what you would advise, what kind of projects would you advise to, to start working on so that the, the um, scientific and engineering community in Mexico can contribute more in a on a technical side rather than, than just to be a passive uh, uh, contributor to, 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 to these kind of projects? Well, first of all, you need to have, uh, from my point of view, no, you, I think you need to have a very good, and that links to, to the question of Paola Castolo Arellano, actually, no, because, um, I mean, you, this, this sort of, you need, you, I think you need to have a better, a better, um, um, better agreements, and that's, uh, that is, uh, that are relevant specifically to our community, no, the science and the engineering community that wants to train people uh, who will actually be working on this, on this uh, sort of projects, yeah? And so you need to have agreements between academia and the industry. And the, in the UK, for example, there are case industry uh, projects, case, case um, PhD studentships are funded partially by the industry and partially by a university. And then you can have very, very, very direct link to the industry and to actually train the PhD students on very applied, very applied research questions. And they can solve these very applied research questions that have a direct benefit for the industry. And once, and once they've been trained, I mean, the industry in the UK employs a lot of PhD um, graduates, yeah, being, uh, having a PhD, I don't want to say it like this, but doesn't force you to stay in academia, yeah, there are many other, other avenues, other career avenues where a PhD is are highly relevant, but you need to actually have this, try to develop the skills from, from the PhD, yeah, and I think we should have better better links no with with the industry and unfortunately that hasn't happened here in mexico there's a lot of um a lot of mistrust no from both sectors uh uh for, against the other no and uh that's something we need to overcome and that offshore wind um in the offshore wind sector is as well very protective uh, uh of uh, some industrial industrial knowledge and uh, we also need better, better um, confidential agreements and uh, a stronger culture, um, uh, confidentiality culture that we need to abide to as well. No, so that's that. Those are two things that are very important. No, unfortunately, we are very we are under a lot of pressure to publish. No, but um, industrial developments actually require some secrecy until they can actually be, be made available to the public, no? So this, this is, we need to balance this to apparently conflicting pressures that we have, no? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Eduardo. Well, maybe we should stop there. Uh, I think uh, Vanessa addressed a little bit the, 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 the question by Paola as well. So I don't see any other. So let's um, uh, let's uh, thank Vanessa once more using your reactions, clapping reactions.